All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the end of week 11 and almost the end of CS50 itself. A couple of announcements. Uh, seminars have begun, even if you did not RSVP for these things. Follow the link on the course's website to seminars, and you can still email the TFs leading them if you would like to attend. But the dates and times have begun to be posted. In fact, there's one this afternoon. If you've ever wondered how to make a Firefox add-on, Brett will be leading one of those seminars today, uh, Wednesday at uh, this afternoon, the time of which is on the seminars page, and then another is coming up this weekend, and many, many more next week. Uh, also, this Friday, per the handout we gave uh, called About Quiz One, there'll be a review this Friday, 3.30 to 5 p.m. The location will be announced on the course's website. Sections this coming week will focus on quiz review, and they'll hold uh, last minute uh, panic office hours next Tuesday night until midnight from 9 p.m. So those will be your opportunities. Uh, the very last lunch with David and TFs will be this Friday, 1.15, RSVP as usual if you would like to join us. And sadly, uh, most sadly of all, our last lecture will be this coming Monday. But like last year, I hear it's going to be amazing so please do join us and tell your friends uh, uh, that that will be taking place same time as usual. And finally, the much anticipated, I'm sure, CS50 store, CS50 for your body, as Yuki and Kato and Aaron and Jansu have advertised here, take one of life's lessons with you, uh, wear CS50. Not only can you term bill such memories as these, but you can also use credit cards and such via Google checkout. So hopefully you will wear CS50 with you well beyond the end of this last problem set. So with that said, today is very exciting because we have a... Um, a uh, power team of guests, all of them faculty members in the computer science department, here to talk about a range of computer science courses and also the material that you will cover in such courses as those. Um, think of these as teasers, perhaps, a uh, pre-shopping period. But it's an exciting time, to be honest, to be getting involved in CS itself. Uh, the introduction of minors by the college recently has certainly generated interest in pursuing additional courses. And so even if you're not considering becoming a CS major, which most of you will not after this course, but rather are considering minoring it or at least dabbling some more. Know that there's plenty of courses after this one that you are now qualified for, including CS51, 61, and 171, all of which we'll talk about a little bit today. And know too that it's an exciting time too because this department, CS in particular, has really grown. I mean, even since I graduated in 99, there are probably twice as many faculty members in the CS department. And in fact, two of the courses you're going to hear a little something about today didn't even exist back then. Although I myself will admit to having taken CS51 as my second course. And it was out of CS50 and then 51 that, uh, as you know, Shuttle Boy was born. So with that said, allow me to introduce Professor uh, Greg Morissette and Raman Zabi, who teach Computer Science 51, our guests. We're multiplexing mics. Hi, I'm Greg. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean for Computer Science and Engineering um, here at Harvard, um, which is just a fancy way of saying essentially the department chair. And um, next semester, I and my colleague, Raman Zabi, who's visiting us from Cornell University, will be uh, teaching CS51. And Raman and I and the course staff have been really rethinking 51 in large part because uh, David Malin is so damn good at uh, teaching 50 that we felt like uh, we needed to revamp some things in 51. And so we've given it a lot of deep thought. And our hope here is to give you a flavor of some of the things that you'll see in 51 so Ram and I are going to tag team on this, because there are really a couple of different aspects about the course. The key thing is that we're going to try to transition folks from being people who can program. Lots of people can program. I have a nine-year-old son. He can program. OK? Uh, and it's not just because I'm a geek. But lots of people can program. The difference is between programming and computer science, right? M making that transition so that you understand uh, all of the aspects. So, and a lot of this boils down to looking at things from the right perspective. Whether it's a computational task or a task in some other domain, you'll find that computer science skills pay off. And from the right perspective, many, many problems that look very hard can become easy. And so in 51, one of the things that you're going to learn how to do is write not just code that gets the job done, but beautiful code. Poems, I like to say. Code that you want to take home and show to your mom. 
All right, uh, it's code that you want to stroke and polish, code that you love, all right? And you may think, well, that's just, uh, you know, fun if you have lots of spare time, but it's actually very important because when you bake code down to that essence, when you pulled out just the right bits, when you have just the right flow, it's a work of art. And it's engineering-wise engineering very efficient. So one aspect of this is that you're going to learn how to write very elegant code. Code that can be understood and easily modified. This is very important because as you well know, especially from experience here, the, the structure of software and the requirements for a given project change all the time. And the whole reason it's soft as opposed to hardware is so that you can make those changes. But figuring out how to a priori structure code so that you can make the kinds of changes you'd like to make uh, is a science and something that you'll learn a lot about. The other thing that we're going to focus on is algorithmic aspects. The, you know, there, there are new kinds of algorithms that have emerged in the last 10 to 15 years that computer science is engaging and using to transform all of science, all right? Be it uh, biology, be it uh, statistics, be it psychology. Uh, and so we're going to introduce you to some of these ideas. And, and the key thing is that you're going to end up having a, a collection of ideas that allow you to solve big problems, big computational problems that uh, at first glance don't look possible or even feasible. Okay? The other thing is you're going to sometimes be able to discover that certain problems that you think are really, really easy are in fact very, very hard. And you know, one of the tools in your tool bag will be uh, after 51, the ability to recognize these problems easily and either transform the problem into something that is tractable or at least tell your boss or whoever's telling you you must solve this problem that it's a non-starter. Okay, so I just want to say a few things about programming and efficiency, uh, programs and efficiency. So uh, the, the right perspective on software can, can vastly simplify programming tasks. So my expertise is in programming languages and software engineering. So that's what I know a lot about. And the goal in the design of programming environments and programming languages is to have code that communicates not just with the machine but with other humans because you're often working with somebody else, right? And so the code needs to be simple, readable, but also easily changed, easily modified to meet new requirements. Um, even today, another goal that we might have, especially for critical, tricky algorithms, is to actually formally prove the correctness of an algorithm. That doesn't happen often. But sometimes an algorithm is so important, uh, for example, uh, in, in Windows, you would love to have a proof that there could be no buffer overrun. Everybody knows what a buffer overrun is. I think David talked about it in class, right? So you'd love to have a formal proof that there is no buffer overrun in Windows. And of course, there isn't such a thing. But can we develop tools that would automatically be able to construct such a proof or transform code so that it has those properties? That's the kind of thing that when we talk about perspective, we, uh, correctness, we'd like to have. And the other thing is that the right perspective on software can vastly improve efficiency. Um, and the goal is really to get fast code where um, the obvious way is too slow. A lot of times when you program stuff, you just throw it together and it works. But then you find out, ooh, if I give it a slightly bigger input, it starts to fall apart. All right? And so you want to be able to identify uh, the critical parts of your code that can be restructured. And that gets back to if you have the right software programming environment, you can do that restructuring quickly um, and, and sometimes change the problem. Okay. So the other thing that I, I want to point out is the language that we're going to use in 51 exclusively is a dialect of scheme. All right, so it's a functional programming language. And why did we pick scheme? We could have picked any of literally thousands of programming languages to teach there. That's what's not important. Over your lifetime as programmers and as software developers, you'll encounter hundreds of programming languages. Some of them you won't recognize as general purpose languages. They may be APIs. So for example, SQL is an API, but it's really a programming language. Regex, regular expressions are another kind of programming language. Uh, CUDA, so uh, Hans Peter Pfister next year is going to teach a course on GPU programming. And that uh, is a new emerging pro uh, parallel programming design. You've heard about MapReduce in the context of Google. These are all programming languages that are really APIs to a big software service. So what's important is not learning a particular language, but learning the key concepts that make up all programming languages. And being able to recognize, oh, that's actually just a closure. 
or, oh, that's actually something that I could encode with closures or with objects or this way or that if I need that kind of functionality when I go to solve a task. So what we're going to be concentrating on is not the particular programming language, but rather key linguistic concepts and key things and patterns that arrive over, arise over and over again in software and how do you recognize those and how do you recreate those in a new context. Okay, so the other thing that I want to say is, is that the right programming language does matter because uh, oftentimes it, it can shape the way that you see the problem and formulate a solution. So my favorite example for this is try to write a, an arithmetic package that manipulates Roman numerals. Right. How would you write just an addition routine for Roman numerals, right? You've got to do one plus one is two, but when you get up to four, it's sort of weird representation, and when you get up to five, it's even weirder. You've got to remember all this mapping. It turns out Roman numerals are horrible as a representation for doing computation, arithmetic. Arabic numbers are much better. Binary is even better. It's even easier, all right? So if you are a Roman, though, and you're using Roman numerals, you would not even think about how to do something complicated with arithmetic because it would be hard. If you have the right programming language, then certain things look and are easy. And again, that gets back to having the right sort of concepts in your brain and being able to map them into the programming environment that you have at hand. So another example is that there are emerging things that happen all the time. So parallelism is a hot topic, right? And the programming languages of yesterday really aren't geared towards good kinds of parallelism. So a good, a good example is you might have a game engine written in C++, and you might really like it to perform very well, and so you'd like to use speculative concurrency as a way to speed up the computation. But it turns out that it's very hard to take standard imperative C++ code and make it speculatively concurrent. On the other hand, it's hard to take languages like Perl which might be easier to do speculation for, and compile them efficiently. So why is that? Those are the sort of things that we're going to talk about in terms of software, programming languages, programming environments. So now I'm going to turn it over to Raman, and he's going to tell you about the other key perspective and focus in the course. Oh, I got one more thing. One more slide. I want to say uh, also there's a deep connection, for those of you who are, are really into foundational mathematics, like me, between code and and math. So it turns out that proofs and functional programming languages like Scheme have a deep correspondence. It even has a technical name called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. And so the key thing there is that analogs in proofs, like a proof by induction, corresponds to recursion in Scheme. And a proof by cases or pattern, corresponds to pattern matching or a switch statement. And a proof by a lemma is really just a function application. And so one way that you can go about designing code to make sure it's right is to first write the proof. And if you write the proof, then you can just extract the code from the proof. And then you have simultaneously a proof of correctness of the code and the actual executable. Now, sometimes you can't do that in the context of an imperative programming language, but if you understand the models and the relationships between functional and imperative languages, then you can pull this kind of trick. And it works both ways. If you have a functional model of your imperative code, then you can start to construct proofs of properties about it. So these are the sort of things, the deep aspects of software that we're going to start to explore. But at the same time, we're going to talk about algorithmic issues. Now, I don't know if I'm, I guess I am live. Okay. So uh, besides the uh, sort of mind-bending ways of thinking about choosing your programming language, um, we're also going to look at uh, trying to make uh, trying try to formulate your problem so it can run efficiently. And there's just a really amazing set of techniques we're going to show you at least some of in uh, this course, including a number of things that are not traditionally done at the undergraduate level at all. Some of the material I'll show you is really typically covered in graduate courses, but we're, we're sort of giving you sort of, you know, uh, a, a, a carefully chosen, uh, interesting uh, version of it. So um, as, uh, as Greg mentioned, um, there's usually an obvious way to solve some kind of computational problem. Um, so, for example, from CS50 in your spell checker uh, dictionary, um, you could represent your dictionary just as an array, and you could just do a linear search of it. Um, and there's, there's almost always some kind of simple, straightforward uh, solution. Um, what happens if this thing is just way too slow? And when a computer scientist says way too slow, don't think, oh, it will take 10 minutes. Think more like it might take until the end of the universe. 
Okay. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, sometimes it turns out that there are vastly better solutions. And I'll show you a little toy example in just a moment uh, where with a little bit of cleverness you can actually do much, much better. Um, moreover, sometimes it turns out that problems, sometimes problems that look hard turn out to be easy. Sometimes problems that are easy turn out, that look easy turn out to actually be hard. And we're going to teach you sort of ways of thinking about these problems that can allow you to distinguish these cases. And as you'll see in just a moment, it's actually quite tricky. Some of these things that look very similar to each other have very different, uh, very different properties. Um, and sometimes you can just end up, you know, discovering that the task that someone suggested that you try to figure out is just too hard. Um, you can prove that you can't and maybe suggest some way of modifying the problem instead. So we're going to cover all of these possibilities. And now for the remaining uh, couple of, uh, remaining uh, sort of uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to preview for you a few sample problems. And uh, these are sample problems that are intended to illustrate the kind of uh, techniques we're going to cover. Um, and they're also, they're not, they're not exactly traditional computer science problems, perhaps. Okay, so here are some friends on Facebook. Uh, probably the only face you might not recognize is the guy at the bottom, uh, the bottom left, that's Larry Summers. All right, so here's a question. Um, let's suppose that uh, Barack gets some good news and uh, we'll tell you a particular piece of good news he uh, got recently, uh, maybe not the obvious one. Um, and we're gonna look at how he can spread that news uh, to his friends. And in particular, uh, we'll look at an initial version of this problem um, that I'm calling the conversation problem. So every person in the conversation problem should have a conversation with each friend. Um, and uh, you want to sort of find a way for the good news to spread. So here's a little example. So here's our people, and they, this Brock discovers a piece of good news, and he tells his Secretary of State, um, and uh, she tells him, all oh, right. And then she tells her husband, and uh, he, uh, he responds in kind. The news continues to propagate. Eventually, everyone has heard the good news. Okay, so that's our sort of a, our first version of uh, the problem. So we want uh, everyone to sort of have this conversation um, and we want them all to have a conversation once. Um, I'm certain that uh, some of them, for, for some of them, once is more than enough. Okay, so that seems like a reasonable problem. Uh, let's look at a slightly different variant of the problem uh, where again uh, Barack is going to share his good news. And in this version of the problem, um, each person hears the news once through a friend. Um, and again, you want to figure out a way for the news to spread. Um, so here's the notification problem. So Barack has the same piece of good news. He's happy. He tells the Secretary of State she's not so happy. She tells her husband he's not happy. Ted's happy. Okay. The news keeps on spreading. Um, and eventually, we're going to spread it through this entire uh, little mini uh, Facebook example um, so that every person uh, learns it once. Okay. So we have these two problems. And they look really, really similar. We're sort of trying to spread the news through the network on Facebook so that everyone learns at once. Okay, um, <laughs> there's actually a really easy way to solve both these problems. You'll notice that I said easy, not smart. Um, in particular, uh, you can just try exhaustive search. If you want to figure out how Barack can sort of pass the news through the network, you can just consider all the different ways. You know, he can first send it to one of a couple different people, they can send it to one of their neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. You just try every possibility. Um, the problem is that in my little, you know, seven, uh, seven person example, that would not take too long, but in a really big network, it would take a really long time. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and it can especially take a long time if there are lots of people with lots of friends. Because after all, Barack has like a million friends. If you're trying to think about all the people he could, spend, he could send it next to, there are a million of those. Each of those might have another thousand friends. Now you're up to a billion possibilities just immediately. Okay. Um, so it can take a really long time. Um, there's also kind of another thing that you can imagine, another sort of obvious solution to this problem, um, which is that you simply, you know, send it to someone who hasn't heard the news, right? That's another kind of obvious algorithm, and we'll call that the greeting method. Um, you just pick a neighbor, and you notify them about the news, or you have a conversation with them. You just pick a neighbor that doesn't know about the news or that you haven't had a conversation with. And you could make this a little bit cleverer, uh, perhaps by being smarter about your choice of neighbors. So, for example, you might imagine sending it first to, if you have a lot of neighbors who haven't heard the news, you first send it to the, the one of your neighbors who has, who's the, who's the most popular, because you'll figure that they'll send it to a lot of people that, uh, afterwards. Okay. Um, sometimes it turns out that for some networks, the news just can't be spread at all. So how could this happen? 
Well, in this particular network, uh, it actually works out pretty well. But there's an easy little example. Um, suppose that there's someone out there, or maybe two people out there, who just have no friends. It's kind of sad. Um, how could you imagine a pair of people whose only friends are each other? OK. Um, in this particular case, uh, you just can't spread the news. Sorry. That's not probably their most pressing problem at the moment. All right. Uh, so these problems actually look extremely similar. We're spreading the news on Facebook. We're spreading it between friends. And we're trying to avoid repetition. One of these problems is really easy, and one of them isn't. Okay. Turns out that one of these problems can be solved pretty easily in order in time. The word pretty easily there is maybe a little bit deceptive. Um, if you think about it carefully, you can solve it pretty easily. Um, the solution is to use the greedy method, just kind of send it to someone who has a, you know, uh, send it to the right neighbor uh, with a little bit of cleverness. For the other problem, no one can do much better than exhaustive search. You know, I told you that it would take a really long time. Um, and no one actually knows how to do uh, much better than that. Um, so let's take a quick poll. So remember, we have these two problems. There's the conversation problem and the notification problem. The conversation problem, pairs of people have conversations. The notification problem, everybody hears it once. One of them is easy. One of them is hard. How many of you think that the uh, first problem, the problem where they're having conversations, is hard? Raise your hand. No one thinks it's hard. Who people think it's hard? OK. How about the other one, where you have to send it to uh, your friends? OK. Most people think, OK, so that, that's, that, that, that's what more, more people think. That turns out to be correct, by the way. Um, but it's not at all obvious. Uh, it, takes a, it takes a bit of thought. Um, and uh, in fact, Greg and I were talking about uh, having the same question at a faculty meeting. It's, it's, not, it's not so clear. Um, the problems really look pretty close to each other. Um, However, for the notification problem and for problems like that, uh, no one knows how to do much better than exhaustive search. And if you could do better, you'll be the most famous computer scientist in the world um, and win a number of fabulous prizes, uh, including a PhD from the university of your choice um, and a uh, million dollars. Um, uh, there's actually a, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the uh, uh, open problems for the Clay Institute. Okay, so that's our first little example of the kind of problem we'll, we'll look at. All right. Um, Here's another example of a, of a fun problem. So this man, probably none of you have uh, actually uh, met him, and probably a few of you have even heard of him. Um, but perhaps he has the world's toughest job. Uh, this is Jay Allard. He's a corporate vice president at Microsoft. Um, and uh, his job is to make the Zune popular. Um, he must be an incredible optimist. OK, some of you are probably at this point wondering what a Zune might be. Um, it's kind of like an iPod. Uh, but it has two important features. Uh, feature number one, uh, it can't use iTunes. So is that a feature? <laughs> feature number two is it's made by Microsoft. OK. So let's try to help Jay out, because God knows he needs help. Um, how could he make Zunes popular? Well, OK, so giving up is, for the moment, we'll just assume that that's not an option. Um, so, uh, you know, Microsoft doesn't have that much money, but they, have, they can scrape together some, some, some money for a couple of free zones, say 25 of them. And his idea is that he wants to give them to Facebook users. Jay, is a, Jay has got to be an incredible optimist, or he would have quit long ago. Um, so his idea is he's going to give them out to some Facebook users, and these people will like them. As I said, he's kind of an optimistic guy, and they'll tell their friends. Um, now, when we sort of think about this problem, we're going to make a little simplifying assumption, uh, which is that, you know, he's going to give some, some free Zunes to people, and those people will tell their friends. And if someone has a free Zune and shows it to you, maybe you get interested. But you don't get, you don't get more excited if, some, if someone else shows you, this, shows you their free Zune. Um, basically, having another friend with a free Zune doesn't make you any more interested. Uh, this is actually somewhat like immunization. Um, if you think of uh, Zunes as being kind of like a, a disease, uh, once, you've sort of, once you've sort of been exposed, you're immunized. And while I am, of course, taking the opportunity to make fun of Microsoft, uh, the, uh, the, the link to immunization is actually quite deep. Um, there's, a, there's a wide area of uh, hot research that studies the way that things like diseases and ideas and fashions spread among people through, through networks. It's an area called social networks. This, is, this example kind of comes from that. OK, so uh, let's look at our problem in a little bit more detail. Um, here are two options for uh, our friend Jay. 
Um, well, he's, uh, maybe he's taken CS51 or some variant of it. Um, so here are two ideas. So the first idea is exhaustive search. Uh, let's try every group of 25 people on Facebook um, and figure out what the best one would be. Um, and that's, that's, uh, oops, hang on. That's guaranteed to find the best group of people um, by which they, by which, I mean it will reach the most people. Um, so what you want to do is you want to pick 25 people uh, where that group of 25 people collectively has the most friends because they'll, they'll hopefully tell their friends about it. Okay, uh, there's one small problem with this uh, algorithm, uh, which is that if you run it, you have to really hope the universe doesn't end first. Um, and the odds are not good. Um, here's another option for J, uh, the greedy algorithm. So what's the greedy algorithm here? Well, let's give the first to Barack. He has the most, po most friends. He's a popular guy these days. Um, let's give the second most to Hillary. She has the second most friends. Um, and that seems kind of like a natural thing to do. So does this work, and can you do better? Well, let's try running our <coughs> little greedy algorithm on our, on our network. Um, so we give it to uh, Barack, and um, again, this is, this is like Jay's dream sequence, right? He gives it to Barack, Barack likes it, first of all, low chance, and uh, tells his friends about it, lower chance, and they therefore like it. Um, so now uh, Barack's told all his friends about it, and all these people know about it. So now we tell Hillary, and she tells her friends, um, little problem here, uh, her friends have already heard about it. So the problem with this greedy solution um, is that Barack's and Hillary's friends overlap a lot, at least in our example, maybe not so much in real life. Um, in this little example, uh, she actually adds nothing. Uh, and uh, frighteningly enough, if you uh, go back to the little example uh, and you want to give it to two people, the first one is Barack. Who's the second one? George or Dick, that's right. <laughs> kind of frightening property, that's right, because uh, Barack's already covered all these guys. Okay, so uh, you want popular people, but you also want ones with distinct friends, which makes the problem a little more tricky. So let's go back to thinking about the exhaustive solution. Um, and let's just think just kind of on the back of the envelope about how long it would take it to run. So let's suppose that Facebook only had 10 million users. It has way more than 10 million users. Um, how many groups of 25 would there be? The answer is over 10 to the 149th, okay? Which is one of those numbers that, uh, you know, in, in just five characters is, is more or less an inconceivable number. Um, just to give you some, uh, you know, some sort of back of the envelope cal calculations, the age of the universe is less than 10 to the 18th seconds. Um, even if you're not a creationist. Uh, so if you could try uh, 10 to the 100th groups, if in a single second you could try, to, you, could, you could consider 10 to the 100th possibilities, okay? 10 to the 100th is, of course, a Google, okay? If you could try that ridiculous number of possibilities in a single second and you started running this algorithm um, when the universe began, you wouldn't be done yet. Okay, and uh, uh, it's unlikely you would finish. Um, just to give you yet another sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 way of thinking about this problem, uh, they're about 10 to the 80th elementary particles. No one's really counted, but it's, you know, 10 to the 80th plus or minus, you know, a, a, a few. Um, and uh, so you really can't solve this problem by exhaustive search, as it, as it turns out. Um, so. Exhaustive search, not so good. Greedy algorithm didn't work so well. Uh, what can you do? Um, can we actually beat exhaustive search? Can we figure out a way to distribute these damn zoons uh, in a way that uh, actually you know, really you know, gets the right set? Um, and is that doable? Well, if you can figure it out, you will win some fabulous prizes. A million dollars and a PhD. Uh, so let's look at a solution to this problem, uh, a sort of slightly clever algorithm. And in fact, um, there's a question mark on this slide because the algorithm isn't necessarily all that clever, but it has a very non-obvious property. So here's our uh, clever algorithm. Uh, you begin by giving the zoom to Barack. I mean, that's kind of the obvious thing to do. You give it to the most popular person. Um, now what you do is you forget about him and all his friends because they've already been infected. Sorry, they've already learned about the zoom. Okay, um, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need to consider them anymore. 
And now you give it to whoever's left who has the most friends. And then you forget about them. And you continue doing this until you've distributed the entire set of 25, until, you, until uh, Microsoft's uh, budget for giving out free Zooms has been exhausted. Um, so uh, you run that method. Now, on the surface, this is actually about as straightforward an algorithm as you can possibly imagine, right? You can, you can write that in a couple lines of code. It turns out it has an amazing property. Remember, you can't actually find the best solution without sort of trying everything. Um, well, let's pretend that if you were willing, willing to try all 10 to the 149th solutions, uh, you would be able to uh, sort of slowly find a way to reach uh, a million people. Um, it turns out that this simple algorithm uh, will actually quickly reach over 632,120 people. Uh, you have to be a pretty serious geek to know what 632,120 is. We'll, we'll leave it as a little exercise. Um, but uh, it's kind of amazing. So you're, this, this really simple algorithm will actually get you the right, will get you very close to the right answer. Okay. Um, two more quick problems, uh, and uh, then I'll turn it over to, the, the, to, uh, to, to Matt. Um, so here's a problem that was on the New York Times recently. Um, let's suppose that someone goes through uh, a shopping cart and uh, buys uh, a couple of things from Walmart. They buy uh, these items, a pogo stick, beer and diapers, uh, beer and diapers in a bad movie, um, beer and God knows what, and three God knows what's. Um, what can you conclude? Well, probably this Walmart is near a college campus. Uh, beer and diapers are also fairly popular, uh, but not quite as popular. Um, and you might be interested in trying to analyze this data. This is actually a really important problem. Try to figure out what's popular, uh, because if things are popular, you might put them next to each other. Um, here's another related problem uh, that we'll also look at. Um, so here's a, uh, a nice view of a college campus. Uh, that's Maxwell Dworkin kind of at the, at the bottom right. Let's suppose that you're out in this quad and you meet a student speaking legal gibberish. Uh, so we mark them there. And then you meet another one, and pretty soon there's a whole flood of them. And uh, your question is, where are they all coming from? Which building is the source? Um, another question you might sort of think about, there, there are kind of obvious ways to answer it, and maybe less obvious ways. A closely related problem is just this general notion of trying to sort of partition your data, make sense of your data in some sort of reasonable way. So. Here's an example. You might have a whole a collection of music where you have sort of classical music, which is you know, uh, slow and, and soft, and some other music as well. Um, maybe these things at the bottom left are in your sort of you know, nighttime collection, the things at the top right are things you play to get up in the morning. Um, here's a new album. Which one is it most like? And problems like this have many formulations, uh, sort of trying to explore the formulations for the data. And uh, these, uh, these many formulations, turns out that with the right perspective, there are ways you can solve this problem fast. Okay. And those kinds of right perspectives, both, both on programming tasks and on algorithmic tasks, are the kind of thing that Greg and I will cover in CS51. So we hope to see you next semester. Up next is Professor Matt Welsh, who teaches a new course which debuted last year for the first time called CS61, Systems Programming Class. And it's Matt's course that has that wonderfully exciting first problem set that I mentioned no. on Monday, that of the binary bomb. So I hope you enjoy this next teaser. OK, I had to shut down my email so you couldn't see all the people posting on my Facebook uh, profile today. Um, all right, great. So it's actually really exciting to be teaching here in Saunders Theater. I've never had a chance. I've, I've been here once uh, before. Uh, you would think they would give all new Harvard faculty a free uh, lecture in this room just to make you feel like a real Harvard professor. So I got it now. Um, what I want to do is just talk to you very briefly about CS61, which is a new class. We started this class last year. And the idea behind CS61 is to um, provide an introduction to computer systems and uh, what's called machine organization, which is really one way of saying, you know, how do computers really work down on the inside? Uh, and this will be uh, offered uh, in fall 2009. Uh, generally, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2.30 to 4, I doubt the time will change. Uh, prerequisites is this class, of course, or for your friends who may not have taken CS50, and I can't imagine why they didn't. Uh, if, if you have C programming experience of some kind, uh, you, can, you can skip over 50 and take 61 directly. Um, uh, CS61 can be used to satisfy the, uh, the breadth requirement uh, in the CS 
concentration, and you can also use it for the CS minor uh, requirement. And uh, my recommendation to most people is that you uh, consider taking CS 61 and 51, uh, in particular if you're going to be a um, uh, CS concentrator, but you know, more generally speaking, that they, they both reflect kind of two sides of the same coin. That CS 61 is about systems programming, CS 51 is about higher levels of computer science, and so they go together very nicely. All right, so what is the class all about? Um, what I want to do in this class is try to reveal how computers really work. So this is about getting under the hood, understanding how processors work, what registers are, how memory works, uh, how compilers work to a certain extent since they generate all the code that your computers actually run, and being able to understand what affects the performance of programs running on your computer. So um, the, the architecture of the processor, that is how, it, how the processor is designed internally, how it accesses memory, what instructions does it provide, how do those instructions interact with each other. Caching and memory management. Um, caches are very important to getting good performance and, and most computers these days have many, many megabytes of cache built in on the processor chip itself. If it weren't for that cache memory, most computers would run hundreds or thousands of times slower than they actually do. It turns out that caching is so important and therefore so is writing code that takes good, uh, good, makes good use of the cache. And also talking about operating system ideas that affect the performance of programming, uh, programs that you run. So processes and threads and dynamic memory management, virtual memory, those kinds of things are very important to understand. So this is a very practical course in a lot of ways. It's about writing very solid systems code, writing very fast systems code and really understanding what's going on down inside so that you know, you can dig down to the, the, the deep mysteries of what's going on inside the computer. The reason that we decided to introduce this course was largely because we perceived there was a, a, a tremendous gap between, I think, the concepts that are presented in a lot of computer science courses and the reality of what's actually going on at the level of the circuits in the computer itself. Um, now, this gap becomes more profound, I think, when you start programming in higher level languages. In this class, you've largely focused on programming in C. C is a very low level language. Some people call C basically syntactic sugar on top of assembly. Yeah? But if you start programming in Java or like I do most of the time, you program in Python, if you only programmed in a language like Python, you would have a very difficult time understanding what affected the performance and the correctness of those programs. And that's because the language hides a lot from you. Now that's a good thing as Greg was saying that having the right language allows you to express things. I can do something in one line of Python that would take me probably 20 or 40 lines to do in C because I can have a list comprehension. It's beautiful. It's clean. It's slick. Yes? And I'm lazy. I'm a lazy programmer so I like programming in Python. But if you want to get good performance, you've got to understand what's happening down on inside the machine. It's also really important to understand how computers work in order for you to understand what happens when you study operating systems, databases, processor architecture, compilers, networks and so forth. And these are of course things that are in the advanced core sequence for the computer science concentration. So if you're planning to be a CS concentrator, understanding some basic things about the guts of a computer help you a lot in going forward. Um, and so even if you're not planning on being a CS major, uh, CS61 is the kind of class that will really help you become a better programmer. Uh, not just better programmer in the stylistic sense and the algorithmic sense, but better programmer in terms of dealing with complexity, getting very good performance, understanding some of the weirdest bugs you will ever see. I promise by the time you are done taking CS61, you will really understand pointers. Yeah, you will really understand pointers. Um, whoops, okay. Uh, Raman already made the joke about the blue screen of death and this is a Mac so you should know better than that. How many times have you seen this? Yeah, many of us have seen this a lot. I haven't seen it in about 15 years because I've never used Windows. But um, if you look at this, most of us would say, what the hell is that? Yeah? Well, what's going on here? Well, we've got a trace of the stuff that's loaded into memory in the Windows NT kernel when it crashed. And if you understood some of the stuff here, you could go and diagnose what was going on. Now, the fault is probably not your fault. It's probably the person who wrote some you know, buggy device driver for your sound card or something that caused the crash, but you know, there are people who know how to read this thing and, and can understand it. With CS61 under your belt, you have a fighting chance at getting, getting some he uh, uh, headway on that problem. How many times have you run a program that seg faulted? Lots? Yeah? It says this funny thing, segmentation fault. 
core dumped. What on earth is that? Yeah? Well, segmentation fault. Well, that tells, that means something. That says the processor has raised an exception that was as a result of accessing a bad memory location. That's what a segmentation fault is. Core dumped, that means it left a file in the directory that the program was running called a core file that contained the memory image of the program at the time that it crashed. Yeah? Most of the time when you run a program in a segmentation fault, no core file is left there. That's because the defaults on most shells are to turn off the core file because to most regular human beings, a core file is useless, so you would delete it anyway, just waste disk space. If you're me, however, you need the core file so you can figure out what happened. Yeah? So if you look at the core file, the core file tells you exactly what the program was doing at the time that it crashed. And if you understood how to look at the core file and walk through it, you would be able to debug the source of the crash and you'd be able to fix your program instead of just, you know, adding more printf's until it works. Yeah? So let's say that I was able to load this core file in. How would you do it? Well, GDB, the GNU debugger, is able to read in core files. So you give GDB the executable, the program that you're running, and you give it the core file, which says here's the snapshot of its, uh, its post-mortem, so to speak. Yeah? And what I can do is use this uh, command that says, well, where was the program when it crashed? And it says, oh, well, it was running in this function called main, and it, had, it was running at this uh, uh, memory address right here, 1FEA. And I can say, well, let me look at the code for that uh, function, but let me not just look at the C source code. I've got the C source code. Yeah, I wrote it myself. I can go look at it. I want to look at the assembly. I want to look at the machine instructions that were running at the time. Why? Because I need to understand what went wrong. I've been staring at the C code for three hours trying to fix this bug. Maybe I need to dig below that level and look at the machine code that the, that the compiler generated and understand what's happening at the machine level instead. So I use this uh, disassemble command and that just prints out all of the machine instructions that were running inside that program and you can go and look at the one where it was crashing and it says, well, it was trying to move the value 42 into the memory location pointed to by the EAX register. What I just said makes no sense to most of you. It would after the second lecture of CS61. Yeah? This is what the processor is doing down inside and it's the result of some line of code that you wrote in, the, in, the C, in, in C that got compiled down to assembly. You should be able to read this and understand what's going on. It's actually not that complicated. Assembly language sounds scary. Sounds like something that only hackers need to understand. Sounds like something that, you know, why would I ever want to look at assembly language? That's like really low level, right? The way I look at assembly language, it's not that you actually need to write any assembly code, but you should be able to read it at least at a basic level. It's like Latin. Yes? Unless you're planning on working in the Vatican, speaking Latin is not that useful of a skill to have. Okay? But reading it is really useful for studying all kinds of texts and understanding linguistics and all kinds of other things. Much the same way with assembly language. If you could read this, you would be able to debug your code better, you'd be able to understand performance anomalies, you'd be able to understand memory bugs, and it would help you be a better programmer. Okay, so here's a very practical example of this. Let's say that um, I left a program in my home directory that when you ran it, asked for a password. And if you got the right password, it would start a shell running as me. So you could become me and then go and delete my files or change your grade in my classes or whatever. Okay? Yes? Um, so if you type in the right password, it starts up a shell as MDW. That's my username. Well, if you get the wrong password, um, it's got a trap door built in so it actually emails President Faust and uh, automatically ad boards you. <laughs> yes. So don't try to guess the wrong password. So you want to guess only the right password. You don't want to guess the wrong one. How would you do it? Well, you're not going to get it right on the first try. Yeah, so do you just not try it all? No, you're determined. Well, let's see here. What is this MDW shell? That's an executable file that was produced by a C compiler. If I could look at the machine instructions inside of that, without even having the source code, if I could read the assembly code inside of that, I could figure out what it's doing and figure out what password it's asking for. Well, if I just try to cat the executable file, you're going to get a bunch of garbage on the screen and it'll probably close your terminal and beep a lot of times at you. So that's not going to work. All these things that look like Icelandic are really machine instructions rendered as ASCII. Okay. Well, if I try to look at it in, in hexadecimal format, OD-X will print out a file and show you the hex. Well, that's not that useful either. 
Well, how about using the disassembler? Obsdump is a disassembler. You can take any executable file. You can take anything. You can take uh, Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or World of Warcraft or whatever. Take the executable, disassemble it, reverse engineer its inner workings. You can figure out what makes the paperclip dance. <laughs> yes? Well, let's look inside. What we see here is a bunch of machine instructions and the disassembler is being very nice. It's printing out the hex but it's also printing out a sort of a human readable mnemonic for each instruction and each one of these lines is one instruction that the processor would execute as part of running this program. Well, if you've never seen x86 assembly language before, of course this isn't, you know, that, that easy to read but it turns out that it's incredibly simple to learn. There's only a handful of instructions that you need to know. Uh, learning x86 assembly is, is, is not so much like learning a new programming language. It's much simpler than that. Um, so we could figure out what's going on here and you'll learn that if you take the class. It's pretty easy. So let's just take a segment of the code here. Well, I could tell you what it does. You know, the first line is putting something called the EBP register on the stack and the second line is copying the stack. You know, we could go through the details of what it's doing. Well, it turns out that in this program, one of the things it's doing is it's comparing the thing you typed to this thing that's sitting in this other memory location. Hmm. Sounds like a way of checking the password, right? So I notice that it's actually looking at this memory location to make a decision about whether the password was correct. Well, let me go and look at that memory location and see what's there. Well, if I look at that section of the memory, I see this, which is another memory address. And you'd know that that was a memory address because the x86 processor is a little Indian and so you'd have to swap the bytes in order to get a human readable form. Again, I'll teach you all this stuff, but you know, this is how hackers do things. This is how they figured out how the iPhone was jailbroken. Yeah? This is how a bunch of interesting bugs have been exploited for nefarious purposes is by people looking at the innards of an executable and figuring out what it's doing and what it might be doing wrong. Well, in this case, if we look at this memory location in the executable and we dump that out, we see this string here, but if we translate that into ASCII, I'm sorry the text is kind of dark, it tells you what the password is and the password is, well, it's take CS61. So that's my little subtle uh, uh, message to all of you. Okay. So this would be just a very simple example. Now that was a really simple example and, you know, I'll walk you through exactly how to do all those things in the class. The first assignment in CS61 is so much fun. What we do is we give you an executable and it asks you for a series of seven passwords. You got to get all seven passwords right. If you get one of the passwords wrong, it sends an email to your TF and you lose a quarter point off the assignment. Now just a quarter point, so you'd have to get it wrong a lot in order to actually damage your grade, but it's going to prevent you from brute forcing it. Yeah? Seven passwords. Now, the first password is something very simple like this where it's a string and you can go look in the executable and figure out what the string is. The rest of the passwords are not so simple. They're things like the result of an arithmetic computation that's being done by the executable. You've got to compare what you type in to the, what the executable is doing. So this is a great way of learning x86 assembly. It's a lot of fun. People get addicted to this assignment. I got addicted to this assignment because I try to do it every year myself just to make sure my x86 assembly is still sharp. And you kind of get sucked into figuring out what the next password is. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. Okay. I want to tell you very quickly about my favorite hack of all time, which is something that I discuss in this class a little bit. Ken Thompson. Uh, he was one of the co-inventors of Unix. I hope you know what Unix is, yes? Probably the most famous operating system of all time. He won the Turing Award in 1983, which is computer science's highest honor. This is like the Nobel Prize for computer science. And as part of winning the award, you go and give a big lecture in a room that probably looks like this one to people wearing tuxedos and stuff. Yes? During the, the lecture he made, and this is, you know, 20 something years after Unix was first developed, he made this stunning uh, revelation and he said that he added a back door into the early versions of Unix that would allow him to log in to any Unix computer. This was before the internet really so it wasn't like that meant he could go log into Unix machines all over the place. And by the way, the back door has been removed so you don't have to worry that he can break into your Linux box or something. But he wanted to make sure that if there was a problem with a Unix computer anywhere, he developed Unix, he wanted to be able to get into it. So he added a backdoor into the login program that would accept a magic password. 
Well, the problem was that everybody had the source code for all the programs. So anybody looking at login.c would just notice, hey, there's this funny hack here that if you type Ken with the magic password, it'll let you in. Yeah? So anybody would have seen this. It was like open source before they called it open source. It's before there was such thing as closed source. Yeah? So anybody could find the backdoor code. So he said, well, how do I hide the backdoor code? I got it. I also wrote the C compiler. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes? So he hacked the C compiler to recognize when it was compiling this file called login.c to add the backdoor code into the executable. And then he deleted the original login.c file. So there is no trace anywhere of his backdoor. Well, now we have a problem. What's the problem? The source code for the C compiler sitting around too. All right. So if somebody happened to be looking inside of there, they see this very suspicious looking code that was hacking login to add the back door. So what did he do? He hacked the C compiler so it recognized when it was compiling itself to add the backdoor code into itself to add the backdoor code into login.c. And then he deleted the original C compiler source code. Does this make sense? It's viral, yes? Every time the compiler compiles itself, it inserts the backdoor. So the next generation of the compiler always has the backdoor hidden inside of it. This must be the coolest thing that has ever been done. I think this is so cool. Um, so the only way you would know that this backdoor existed at all would you'd have to look inside of the binary code for either login or the C compiler. You'd have to disassemble it and look at the assembly and you'd look at the assembly and you'd say, wait a minute, there seems to be some assembly code here that doesn't correspond to any C code that I've ever seen. Yeah? So it's one of the coolest hacks ever and he got away with it for some time. I don't know how many systems had his little funky back door on it, but it was early days of Unix. So it wasn't like he was breaking any laws. Okay, so just to wrap up. So why do you want to take CS61? CS61 is going to help you understand how computers work. It's going to help you debug the hardest and most interesting bugs you will ever see. Um, as I said, you'll be able to hack binaries for fun and profit. You know, the code vet, I, I do a whole lecture where I talk about the code red virus and how it kind of took over the whole internet because it was exploiting stack overflow bugs in Microsoft's web server. How to measure the performance of your programs, how to optimize them, and how to write concurrent multi-threaded programs like a pro. So after CS61, you're going to get kind of a lot of uh, exposure to these system things. So sounds pretty hard. I want to emphasize CS61 is really intended to be an intro level course. It's meant to be the same difficulty level as, say, CS51. It's not intended to be a really advanced course. It is intended for non-CS concentrators as well as CS concentrators. So we try to emphasize a lot that um, only about half the people who take 61 this year, I think, are CS concentrators. Um, I had people taking uh, CS61 last year who were classics majors, yeah? So they took my whole advice on Latin seriously. Um, there's five lab assignments. The first one, you hack a binary. The second one, we give you a binary that's got bugs in it, and you have to exploit the bugs in order to cause the binary to do things it was not designed to do. Yeah? The third one, you implement malloc. There's where you learn about pointers for real, okay? Um, you're going to write your own Unix shell, and then the final lab is a lot of fun. You write your own concurrent multi-threaded server. You get to work in pairs on the labs, so you have help. Um, and the midterm and the final are both take-home exams, so, you know, they're a little bit less stressful than some other exams. Okay, so what we'll talk about in the class, x86 assembly language, um, performance measurement, linking, loading, memory, uh, Unix systems programming, files, pipes, signals, processes, thread synchronization, uh, Unix sockets, and implementing concurrent servers. That's the syllabus. You can go look. All the um, lecture notes and everything from this year are online. You can go to the CS61 webpage, look through them. You can look at the labs. You know, the same, be the same labs next year. So you can kind of get a sense of what the workload's like. Okay. This is the last thing I want to say. So how many know this reference here? Yes? I like to think of this a lot. This is, the matrix, by the way, was written by people who are totally computer geeks. Had to be. There's a lot of parallels between what happens in the matrix and what happens in computer systems because when you're above a certain level, everything kind of seems imaginary. But when you get down to the guts of what's happening inside the computer, you really learn what happens. So take CS61. That's the red pill. 
You can also take the, the blue pill or the green pill or whatever, take CS51, take them both. I'm not saying it's one, either or, but definitely by taking CS61, I will show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All right. If you have questions, just email me or come by my office sometime. Thank you. Computer Science 171, Visualization, which is all about putting to use some of the skills you've acquired in this course and would acquire in some of these other courses and using them to present interesting and particularly large data sets in compelling ways so that humans can actually make sense of what on first glance might itself be rather overwhelming. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Hans-Peter Pfister, as Dave said. and. After listening to the previous two presentations, I'm really pumped up to take CS51 and CS61. Um, I actually probably should because I'm not such a good programmer myself. <laughs> I'm a visual guy and I'm going to teach uh, visualization. My background is in computer graphics and computer vision. So um, if you look up visualization in the dictionary, you'll find actually quite useless information that doesn't relate at all to what we're going to talk about in the course. <laughs> So you'll find it's about forming mental images and making things visual. Um, you know, I'm all for the power of positive thinking and you probably should use that for your finals. But in the class, we're actually talking about convey information through graphical means or through visual means. And so here I just show you a bunch of examples. I don't have to, I think, uh, convince you that visualization is very important because you're actually encountering it every day. So here's just some recent examples showing you some information about the economy, uh, Dow Jones index and some other information. And you know, you can't open the paper or turn on your TV anymore without seeing some form of graph. So visualization is, is clearly very important and it's uh, prevalent. Now it's also very old. Um, we can go way back to the stone ages when people painted on cave walls. But you know, in the uh, early or late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, uh, William Playfair actually invented the concept of graphs and charts. So he's responsible for inventing line graphs, bar graphs, and the infamous pie chart. And ever since, we've been using these tools to make sense of data. And it turns out that our human visual system is actually really good at making sense of data this way. It's a lot better than to looking at Excel spreadsheets. So what has changed since then? Well, the big change has really been the addition of interaction. So quite often when you do a visualization nowadays, you not only want to look at your information, but you want to interact with it. And typically that's because the visualization may bring up some interesting questions about the data that you may want to answer. So here is an example of the Dow Jones. And if I go, in this case, to the Google website, hopefully it will show me what's currently going on and I can actually, can you see this? Yeah. I can actually zoom in here. So I have little sliders here that let me zoom in and zoom out. So I can see exactly what's going on today. I can even find information about, you know, relationship of what's going on in the market to what's happening in the world and link directly to information that it's online. Now this kind of interaction is extremely important and in CS171 you'll actually learn how to build these types of interactive visualization applications. So let's go back to the slides. Let me show you another graph. Again, uh, this is financial information. This is from the New York Times website and we can jump there real quick. So this shows you the amount of deficit or budget shortfall across the United States broken up by state. And, you know, one thing you may notice, uh, first of all, you know, there's a, a bubble chart here overlaid on top of the map and the size of the bubble tells you actually how big that budget shortfall is. So the bigger, the worse. And if you look at this closely, you may notice this big bubble over here, right around Massachusetts and lo and behold, Turns out we have one of the biggest budget shortfalls because of the economy right now and we're going to be in big trouble. So you actually can drill into this data and you can find some information related to this data using these interactive tools. 
Let me show you a last example. This is called the map of the market and you may have never seen this kind of visualization before. It's called a tree map. So each square here represents a company and the size of the square gives you an idea of their market capitalization. So the bigger the square, essentially the bigger the company. And then the companies are grouped hierarchically into different sectors of the economy. And I took this uh, actually just a couple days ago when I was preparing my slides. So uh, the color coding here shows you how much percentage change has there been in the value of these companies related to the previous closing of the market, right? So what you're seeing here is basically red. That tells you that that was a really bad day for the economy. So a lot of these companies, a lot of these different sectors of the economy really went into a tailspin. But what's interesting is there's a bunch of them that actually are green. And so you may want to find out why are these uh, companies green and what kind of companies are they? And you know, what kind of information um, do I need to know to maybe invest in them? So I can actually also quickly go to check what's happening today after I skip this annoying ad. Um, I don't know how to skip it, so, oh, here we go. So if you search for a map of the market in Google, you'll find it and we see a much more balanced picture today. But again, what's really neat is I can hover over these different squares and I can find out you know, even Exxon is now uh, making some losses here and that's probably not good, whereas some other sectors are starting to make some minor gains again. Whereas, you know, some of these, Morgan Stanley apparently had a good day today. So these types of interactive visualizations are really um, becoming state of the art and again, as I said, a lot more effective than looking at rows and columns of numbers. So why do we need visualization? Well, one thing is to communicate. Here is an example of a static page that was printed in the New York Times showing you the California wildfires last year. And it actually relays a lot of information. So if you look at this, um, they actually show you the extent of the current wildfires compared to some previous wildfires in 2000. They give you more detailed information with a narrative to tell you exactly what's been going on in these different areas in California. And so this is really meant for a lay person who doesn't really normally read visualizations and wants to basically understand what's going on in California right now. So there is a lot of annotation and there is a lot of detail in these maps. Visualization are extremely important to answer questions. So uh, similar uh, data set, this is also about the California wildfires, but if you wanted to know where is the closest shelter if I have to flee my home, the best option for you would have been to go online and then find on Google Maps that some people had produced mashups of evacuation centers, related them to different hospitals and to the areas where the wildfires were happening. So of course, you know, you've been using maps probably very frequently already and in CS 171 we'll be talking about how do you produce these mashups in order to make those maps richer with more information that you may actually have downloaded from the internet. As I said, um, we can't escape maps and we can't escape visualization. So here are a bunch of recent visualizations of the presidential election and the classic red state, blue state uh, maps. And if we compare that to what happened uh, in 2004, we see that the landscape has a little bit changed since then. So in 2004, a lot of the newspapers printed this type of map. And when you see this, you immediately think, oh my God, you know, what, what kind of country are we living in? <laughs> Depending if you're red or blue uh, favorite. Um, and so uh, the problem with this is, is actually that the visualization isn't telling you the whole story. What is it not telling you? Yes, population, exactly. So well, let's dig in a little deeper. So first of all, we find that the race was actually extremely close, right? So in the popular votes, there were only three million voters difference between Bush and Kerry. 
But if you look at the amount of area on the map, there is just a whole lot more red than blue. So we can break this down by county and we can even shade it based on the percentage of voters that voted for one candidate or the other. But this still isn't giving you quite the right picture. And again, it's related to population. So the New York Times came up with this visualization. It actually shaded the map based on population density. So that areas that are largely unpopulated are essentially white. And I think this gives you a much better picture of how these votes were cast and doesn't look quite as dramatic as the original picture may have suggested. So what we'll look at in CS171 are all the different design techniques that we can use to convey information truthfully and to make sure that we're actually uh, conveying the right information. Here is another example. Um, visualization can uncover patterns. So here the people at New York Times plotted the different batting averages of Hank Aarons, Babe Ruth and Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds here in red. And typically when a, batter, uh, a baseball player gets older, their batting average starts to taper off. But if you look at Barry Bonds, all of a sudden there is this stark increase here in his performance, which is quite uncharacteristic. And it turns out that this is about the time when people suggested that he may have been using steroids. So we can uncover these type of patterns by looking at the data. Here is a nice one. Uh, this is a so-called world tree, word tree uh, visualization that is on uh, one of my favorite visualization sites called Many Eyes and we will be using Many Eyes uh, quite a bit in the class. So what this visualization shows you is the text of the Alberto Gonzalez um, uh, speech when he was uh, supposed to become, uh, sorry, what was he supposed to become? Attorney General, th uh, Attorney General, thanks. So he actually, uh, so what you're seeing here is the size of the word corresponds to the number of times that the word was mentioned in his text, in his, uh, in his deposition. And he used I don't recall a lot, obviously. So what's nice about this, we can start to drill into this. So, you know, I don't recall the specific mention of this conversation, specific reason. So what's interesting is uh, based on the size of these sentences, it turns out that he actually literally used the exact same words multiple times during his deposition. And that suggests that maybe um, he was coached really well and started to memorize these sentences and uh, literally verbatim repeated them during his deposition. Here is another word visualization. This is from the uh, John McCain uh, concession speech and it's called a whirlwind. Um, it's a, a funny way to display frequency of word usage in a speech and it's become a little bit of an internet phenomenon. So a lot of people do wordles of different speeches or different types of texts. And you see he talked mainly about country campaign. What's uh, kind of neat is if you look at this little thing, that's the only mention of Sarah Palin. So visualizations can also inspire and we'll talk about some famous visualizations uh, and also some recent examples where people really used visualizations to inspire. By the way, this is the same uh, kind of visualization of Obama's acceptance speech. So what are the goals um, in CS171? We want to talk about what makes visualizations effective. What are the principles behind it? And we also want to give you an overview of some applications of visualizations. We'll talk about uh, different types of applications. And more, uh, most importantly, we want to enable you to implement your own interactive visualizations, very similar to what I've just shown you. So that will really allow you to take your programming a step further. And we're going to be using processing, which is a Java framework. So you'll be mainly programming in Java. And we'll also be introducing Python web scraping, so you can actually scrape your own data from different websites and implement your own web crawlers. So there's uh, three acts to the class, just like an Italian opera. Uh, act one, foundations. So we'll talk about data models and web scraping and data mining and data reduction. Then we'll talk a lot about visual perception. 
and cognitive principles. What does make a particular color encoding more effective than another one? Um, we'll talk about color as I said. Design principles. How do we maximize the uh, information content in an, inform in an uh, visualization? And also a little bit about interaction design. Talking about what kind of interactions are most useful to convey information. Act 2 is the uh, broad overview of different visualizations that you might be using. Charts and graphs are very prominent because those are the most useful visualizations. Then we'll talk about maps, Google Earth, trees, networks, social networks for example, and also higher dimensional data, text and images and video. And finally act three, um, besides me dying, <laughs> um, as in any good opera, we'll have a um, bunch of guest lectures. We had last year a whole bunch of people that were uh, coming by talking about all kinds of different interesting topics. And I'm not exactly sure who's going to be able to come next year, but I can promise you um, I'll try my best to get the same people or a very similar set of people to comment. And those talks are usually a lot of fun because you get a different perspective from some of the very famous people that are in our field. So more information on the web. Uh, lectures are Monday, Wednesday, 1 to 2.30. All of the lectures are videotaped. They'll be actually streamed live and also archived online so you can look at them in the convenience of your living room if you so choose to do so. And we have four homeworks, one midterm take home exam. And the key uh, uh, actually is a final project that you can do either alone or in teams of two where we ask you to choose a topic of your personal interest. Basically ask a question about something and then go get the data and do the visualization to answer that question. And just to wrap up I would like to show you um, a bunch of examples of what the students had done last year. So by the way this is all online at cs171.org so you can just go there and look at the final projects yourself. But um, Alex Chu was very interested in piano and so he did a visualization of music. I'm just going to play this back here. Um, so he, he took a MIDI file, he analyzes the MIDI file and then he visualizes which piano keys are being pressed and he shows you kind of the time sequence, very reminiscent of these old uh, drum roll uh, pianos. And what's interesting, he also implemented bar charts of frequency of key presses. This is overall over the whole piece and then over here it's actually grouped by octave so he grouped all of the octaves into one in the center octave here and uh, you can get sort of an impression of, of what's going on. So, so I think that worked pretty well. Here is a very useful one. Um, uh, Samir and Jesse took the Q data and made it interactive. So I'm sure you all know about the Q guide. So you can actually go to our site, or to, their, to their site I should say, and you can look at the Q data online. So here are all of the classes that you can take at Harvard. And uh, let's say, let's go to computer science. Let's pick computer science 51. <laughs> so this data was from 2007, I believe. So back then, uh, Radhika was teaching CS51. Uh, so you can look at the overall score broken down by number of scores. I mean, number of people who voted um, per different score. Here is the rating for the teacher. Here is the rating for the readers for the readings, sections, workload, difficulty and so on. And then finally recommendation. Oh yeah, you really should take CS51. <laughs> but what's actually really most useful in my opinion and probably in yours is you can actually filter these classes based on the workload rating. <laughs> so if you're really inclined to do very hard work, you might want to take government 1000. What's really cool too is you can click on this and now we're filtering the opposite, right? So if you want to do something really, really easy, maybe anthropology is your game. <laughs> so um, 
again, you know, this interactive application is actually quite fun to play with and I invite you to, to take a look. Let me just show you one more for fun. Um, we also had uh, Daniel. He, uh, he actually was really interested through a roommate of his to look at the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And he set out to do a piece of art, essentially. He wanted to have an artistic visualization of the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And he came up with this really intricate algorithm to draw these, in my opinion, kind of beautiful pictures. And he has a nice write-up on the website. And it turns out, unfortunately, he couldn't quite connect it to the poetry. <laughs> so it's a little bit more random than it is related to the poetry. <laughs> but, you know, this is, uh, this is art, right? So I'm not going to argue with this. And I, I, just like, um, I just like having this creative spirit in the class. And finally, let me show you uh, maybe something a little more useful. So Karen Feng, she looked at different technology blocks and she wanted to know, so you know, these are all somehow related because a lot of these are co-owned by the same companies, right? So here is a bunch of uh, blog articles. So each bubble here is an article and the size of the bubble again gives you the frequency of the number of links to that article, right? So bigger bubbles mean articles that were more popular by number of links linked to them. And, uh, and then you can actually see over here, so who on the right, you see who actually um, was listing that article. And you can also go over here and hover over these and you see, for example, which articles were on Gizmodo versus uh, Geek Sugar. So, you know, Geek Sugar had some of the less popular articles, but who knows, maybe they were a little bit more interesting. Uh, 3D, 3G iPhone to include GPS. She also did another visualization um, to look at the links between the different blocks. So which block links to which other block and again sorted by frequency shown here in a nice stocked, uh, stacked uh, bar graph. So Gizmodo had actually links to many of these other blocks but mostly to the tech block and so on. So you can, you know, dig deeper into these uh, data sets. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude and I hope to see you at CS171. Don't let the one in front of the 71 scare you. It's really not such a hard class and we really hope to see you. Thanks to our guests. Even though 50 is soon ending for you, take CS51, 61, 171 and return on Monday for our final amazing lecture where I will likely be wearing sweatshirts and sweatpants.